I wonder if I could ask you to to speak more about um, in which in one sense is really hard the inevitability of death that is coming for all of us um, yeah. and and Lewis writes about that in this article and in many other places yeah. with a starkness yeah. that is pretty jarring um, yeah. uh, but it is uh, in it is also helpful he he makes the point I think it's on in learning uh, in wartime about how um, ancient cultures um, is far more than our modern Western mindset uh, kept in view sort of the inevitability of death and how we like to forget about that um, yeah. and and we forget about it to our detriment um, but it is we forget we want to forget about it because it's not fun or hard to think about our own deaths and the deaths of those that we love. So I wonder, Bill, if I could just ask you about that and about the the Christian response to that. Um, because if we don't have the Christian response, um, this is already a pretty depressing video. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah, and that's the reality that regardless of where we're coming from, uh, from a, a faith standpoint, I don't know uh, all who are listening to this and watching this where you might uh, be very agnostic right now and maybe this moment has even made you that way it's like man i thought i believed in god but this is really shaking some of that for me um and uh or or maybe you've just been in a place of I've, I've always had some questions about the christian answer but the reality is all of us whether you know it's an atheist perspective a theistic perspective um an eastern uh perspective uh, every worldview, every kind of philosophy or religion or framework of thought has to give an answer or wrestle with the question of what happens when I die. Um, and I think there's a lot of different answers out there to that. And, uh, you know, for example, the naturalistic answer would just say, um, yeah, when I died, nothing happens. I just ceased to exist. And I was nothing more than kind of uh, a collection of cells, a, a bag of bones, um, and some water and i'm just going back to that um the you know more of a tibetan buddhism kind of response might be uh, you know death is just part of the cycle of life and death and reincarnation and kind of the how well you live your life determines the kind of incarnation that you have in the next but both of those answers even though those are very different level they actually are saying the same thing which is death is just a normal part of the reality of things it's not a big deal we just have to kind of accept it but christians actually say loudly forcefully that no death is absolutely not the way it ought to be uh that death is a monster that it's an invader that it's an intruder that death is not natural um and that we have then the confidence and i just uh, prepared a, a sermon for uh, on psalm 23 and one of the great comforts for christians of psalm 23 is this promise right at the middle of it the, i think it's the beating heart of the psalm is that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? For you are with me. So we have a good shepherd who has laid down his life for the sheep. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that if you believe in me, that even though you die, you will live again. And then he asks Martha or Mary or Martha, who he's saying that to you in that chapter in John 11, do you believe this? I think that's the question for each and every one of us is, do you believe this? Do you believe that you have a good shepherd who has given his life, who will be with you in death, who will hold you fast, who will not let you go? Um, and so I love this. Uh, Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller has a, a new book out called On Death. It's really short. It's like an hour and a half as an audio book. Um, and there's this great part in it where he quotes the, the poet George Herbert. And George Herbert says this, that death used to be an executioner. The gospel has made him just a gardener. Death used to be an executioner, but the gospel made him just a gardener. And so um, the great hope that we have as, as Christians uh, is that death, the, the worst that death can do us is plant us, as Keller says, in God's soil. So we become something truly extraordinary one day. Um, and so that's the hope I think that, that we as Christians have in, in that answer. Um, and again, you can push back and debate that answer, but I personally have found that to be um, not only an intellectually credible answer when you look at the, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, um, but also a deeply uh, satisfying and deeply comforting answer in those moments when I'm laying in bed at night to be able to quote to myself, I need fear no evil for you are with me. Mm. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me.
So, um, sorry, that might have been a little long call. But, no, uh, that was yeah. that was that was perfect, Bill. I really appreciate that. And I too have been uh, quoting Psalm twenty three to myself every night before I go to bed. Um, okay. That is a psalm to wrap around our hearts in this moment and in every moment. And it's not long. Um, it doesn't, shouldn't take terribly long to memorize. And, um, you know, I can think of, gosh, very few activities that would be better than dedicating a few minutes to trying to memorize Psalm 23 so that you can recite it to yourself and remind yourself of its truths and its promises, even when you, you don't have a Bible in front of you. Um, so I've been doing the, the same thing. And I, I love that. And I also love too that the Hebrew um, of Psalm 23 allows the translation of those verses to say um, either even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death which applies to what you were sharing but you can also translate the Hebrew to say even when I walk through the darkest valley or the valley of deep darkness so there's a, even a broader application I think um, to those verses and that promise of God's presence with us in the midst of whether it be the great enemy which is death or uh, any other em enemy like like social distancing is kind of an enemy. I mean, it's a way we can love our neighbors, but we weren't built uh, as creatures to social distance. Um, and I want to ask you about that, actually. But I also want to say, because um, I've had the deep privilege of sitting with many students that have come into my office this year, and, and a lot of conversations um, with them actually have have centered around uh, death and around the death of the loved ones that they have experienced. And yeah. um, one of the things that I've, I've heard um, in those conversations uh, as we've, because we've made death and, and the hope of the resurrection a theme in chapel this year mm -hmm. um, is, man, you know, my story of death that I've had with my loved ones, my friends, my family that I've experienced in my life, it's not, it's not, it's not what I'm seeing on stage or it's not um, what's being represented in that space. And so I just always want to be sensitive, um, you know, when we're interviewing, when Bill is kind of presenting, when I'm talking about death and the hope that, that we both find in Jesus, uh, in no way do we want to be insensitive to, to any of you that might be listening or watching that just have had a different experience or more difficult or can't, for some reason, can't find the hope that, that he and I find in the midst of that. So always, almost even want to, just as a disclaimer, and always want to invite more conversation. Um, so if you're watching this and kind of having some of those thoughts feel free to reach out to me to to chat about some of those things but um bill and i are deeply convinced that death is a monster it's the great and final enemy and that um the only way to defeat it um ultimately is is by trusting in jesus and the, the good shepherd that lays his life down so um and if i can just add to that paul yeah. you know, just for those maybe who you are in a place where you're feeling deep deep loss and grief maybe over the death of a loved one uh or maybe just over the reality of your school year did not turn out how you thought um, and you don't feel God and you feel distant. I just want you to know in the midst of that, that, you know, Jesus, who is the one, if anyone has a the deep connection to God, the father, it's Jesus who says, I am one with the father. And yet in the moment of his greatest darkness, um, his request to have this cup pass from me is denied. And he calls out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if you find yourself experiencing that emotion, experiencing that sense of God's absence, uh, know that Jesus also experienced that. There's not something wrong with you. Uh, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Um, I don't know what he's doing in your life uh, in the midst of that, but just know you're in the same company as Jesus when you find yourself in those places. So anyway, I just want to add that in, Paul. Yeah. Well, I, no, thank you, Bill, for that. And, and I appreciate that. And we can bring it full circle because it is, I don't believe that it is an accident that Jesus in, in saying on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting a Psalm. I always take um, deep comfort in knowing that when I read the Psalms, I'm reading something that Jesus himself read. And um, yeah, that just washes over me actually in a lot of ways um, and comforts me in a lot of ways. And so Jesus is quoting from a Psalm when he says that. And the Psalm that he is quoting from is Psalm 22, um, which is right before Psalm 23. <laughs> and yeah. um, I just, you know, the, the, the Psalm book was very intentionally crafted and I don't think, I mean, Psalm 22 is a really difficult psalm, um, one of the most difficult um, and one of the most dark and hard, not quite as dark as Psalm 88, um, but, uh, but it's close to it. And I don't think it was a mistake that the Psalter who organized this book 
put Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 right, right next to each other. So maybe that's even a, a pathway for us to read those Psalms together um, and just know that when we read Psalm 22, we're reading something that was clearly close to Jesus's heart and experience uh, in the midst of that.